Thanks for taking a um, thanks for taking a nice afternoon. Should probably all be out taking a hike, and uh, can do that um, yet today or tomorrow. Pleased to have all of you here, so we can have a little conversation about uh, aquatic invasive species. Um, it's a conversation that we started about for some of us, other than the gentleman on my right over here. For some of us, it's probably a conversation so we started maybe three or four years ago, and it's gotten more intense in the last couple of years. Uh, and I'm unfortunately believing that it's probably going to be the subject of most of our conversations in the media and some other things for a while. Uh, it doesn't seem to be getting any less. So on behalf of the Whitefish Area Property Owners Association, we welcome you to uh, this <coughs> seminar workshop. Um, we've been calling it both partially because we think that there's going to be some technical items. Um, I actually hold uh, some college appointments to teach, and uh, I was thinking maybe I should have gotten into the dean's office before I left yesterday and see if I could get you uh, three college credits or two college credits, depending on how well Mike and Dan do. Let me introduce the uh, folks in the DNR that are here. Uh, in the blue is Dan Swanson. He's a uh, uh, aquatic invasive or invasive species specialist out of the Brainerd office. And I gather he deals with both aquatic and terrestrial items, right? Mostly aquatic. And next to him is Mike Duvall. Mike is the uh, regional district manager for ecology and water resources of the DNR, which means he's got about uh, five counties or something or other. Uh, Rich Rosinka is Dan's counterpart out of Grand Rapids. He's the, uh, an invasive species specialist out of there. Um, what I understand, Rich is actually t taking a look at the bottom of our lake in certain locations with his diving gear on. And maybe he'll tell you what he found, where the fish were or something of that sort as well. <laughs> and uh, the newest person that some of us haven't really met before is Robert Haberman. And Robert is the gentleman who uh, is a con part of the conservation officer crew for the DNR. And uh, some of you do know uh, we've had the uh, Carrie and, and Nikki Schultz as our conservation officers in this area for quite some time. Carrie retired a little over a year ago, a couple years ago actually, probably now. And uh, Nikki retired here on the first part of, of August uh, this summer. And uh, now what do you do when you're a conservation officer on this lake, enjoying the water, and now you just get to go fishing or whatever it is. <laughs> Anyhow, Mike Lee is not here, but he's the new conservation officer, of course, on the cross lake end of the chain of lakes in this area. and. Uh, a vacancy and Robert tells me they will have a, a new Nikki uh, on the west end of this area in not too distant future. A couple of uh, sort of technical items. First and probably most important, the bathrooms are right around the corner. For those of you that have been in the, the ideal town hall, they haven't moved them. <laughs> and, uh, and you can use those certainly as you need. Second of all, uh, Jim O'Keefe is our video gentleman today. And uh, the video of, of this particular seminar will be posted on our website, WAPOA's website. So if you've got neighbors and family, uh, my wife couldn't be here and she said, I hope there's a video. And I said, well, I'll tell you what the link will be as soon as I learn it. So it'll be out there for those that are interested um, in, in doing that. And you can watch that. Uh, look for it on our website. I can't tell you how long it'll take to turn it around, but it'll, it will certainly be there. The agenda for the day, um, I was traveling back up here and, and um, I was thinking, you know, what are the issues? So I thought maybe what I'll do is challenge these guys with a series of about five questions. In other words, when we talk about aquatic invasive species, what do we know? Of course, the reverse of that is what don't we know? Probably the third question related to that is how do you know that you don't know? Um, in other words, what can't you tell me that you don't know? Huh? Dan's pretty good. I've heard Dan talk about that. Um, what are some of the detection methods they've been using? You've seen some piece of information lately about some plankton sampling they've been doing and, and certainly some lab work on some of these sort of things and, and that sort of matter. What are some of the solutions? 
Um, I'm hoping that Mike or Dan or Rich can chat a little bit about uh, what Dr. Sorensen is about to is launching at the University of Minnesota. And uh, I don't know if he's selected his counterpart yet, but there are one of three candidates that are research professors um, who are being interviewed down there, and we happen to like one of them very much. Uh, Dr. Dan Malloy is the uh, research scientist in the biology, aquatic biology area, who is actually the the uh, creator of Zequinox, that some of you have heard about, that's being tested in in uh, Minnetonka and up in the Alexandria area and, and so forth. And then uh, the last comment um, that I've got on here is what are some of the things we should be doing this fall as a way of detection, prevention, identification, um, as we put away boats and docks and lifts and, and all those sorts of things. Today, what, uh, during that presentation, um, we're going to pass out some 5x8 cards, I guess these are, 4x6, 4x6 cards. Um, and what we want you to do is write down any questions that you may have. Uh, and we're going to try to, to uh, get these guys through a number of those questions. So if we've got like kinds of questions, we'll pull those and so forth and so on. And we'll address those questions as we can. So just take them and write them on here and we'll gather those when you, when you have them. I'm going to put in a pitch for Wapoa. The Whitefish Area Property Owners Association uh, has been around a long time. Uh, we're an organization of over a thousand members about a thousand of whom are private property owners. We've uh, learned as part of a presentation Dave and I did, Dave Fisher has been our past president, um, that we are actually the eighth largest chain of lakes in Minnesota. We're competing with lake chains that identify themselves with only one body of water, like Minnetonka, Mille Lacs, Gull. Uh, we happen to be the Whitefish Chain of Lakes with 14 lakes. And so we've got to, we're going to actually have a little conversation with uh, the commissioner to tell him that on the uh, site where he talks about the 10 largest lake chains in Minnesota, we need to be number eight. And hopefully that will attract some attention and research money and other sorts of things that will help us with our, with our agenda. We'd like you to, if you're not a member of WAPO, we've got some material that we can get you and we'd love to have you join us in this battle. Uh, we do think that the partnership between volunteer organizations like ourselves working with the DNR are going to be uh, critical for the long term. That will not, this will not be a short term task. Um, and I won't repeat a lot of that, but as an example, on, on Bay Lake where they have Eurasian milfoil, knock on wood, we don't yet. Hopefully not. Uh, they spend somewhere between $130,000 and $160,000 a year in, in trying to prevent the spread of Eurasian milfoil. They've been doing that since 1992. And so you can see this gets to be a little pricey if, if in fact we have some problems. We're going to try to do programs on part of WAPOA um, several times during the year. We think these kinds of programs are, are probably helpful to all of us. We did one last uh, earlier in the spring on, on uh, on-site septic systems and managing those. Uh, there will be plenty of topics coming along. Someday maybe we'll get Dr. Sorensen up here or we'll get some of the other research pieces when we learn about that, and we can certainly share that with you. So, without any further ado, I think I will bring, uh, who is it? Mr. Duvall, Mike? Are you gonna lead off? Sure, I'll, I'll just, uh, just a few comments. Um, first of all, just thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to talk with you today. Um, we're gonna focus um, uh, through Dan's presentation a lot on the zebra mosses. I think that's the the high profile issue. You're interested in the broader topics of aquatic invasive species, we'll be glad to entertain those and probably through the questioning process uh, we can expand the topic what we'd like to, to write net now, share with you sort of uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, discovery and the actions and, and maybe uh, look a little bit uh, forward in, in what this means for, uh, uh, for whitefish chain. So, uh, with that, I appreciate again the invitation, appreciate the focusing questions to help us kind of, as we uh, do our presentation, we come back to these five, uh, five points here. So um, with that, I'd like to, to bring Dan Swanson up, and Dan's the guy that's on the ground uh, doing the, the, the redeal, really the detailed work that helps us understand the nature of these uh, infestations and, uh, and can give you the technical aspects of this. So Dan? Thank you. 
Well, again, <clears throat> thank you for inviting us today. And it's a serious subject we're going to discuss today. We've got a large audience here, and you're here because you're concerned about your lakes. You want to learn more about what we've discovered this summer. So I'm going to go through a story about what happened out here this year, what we've done as a DNR to monitor uh, this new infestation. One thing I want to say is I haven't worked much on the Whitefish Channel. I started in Brainerd in 84, and I've been working with nuisance plants and invasive species, and I guess it's your fortune that I hadn't been out there, but it was my fortune that I got to work on these lakes this year. There's not, in my mind, a more beautiful uh, scenic lakes, lakes to recreate on. I've been out there for two months, and it's just an awesome uh, number of water bodies connected, and I appreciated being able to work on those waters. So what are zebra mussels? Well, they're a freshwater mussel and very small. A majority of our native mussels that we have are relatively large in comparison. These adults are only from an inch to maybe two inches long. They are what we call a bivalve. That's that they have two shells. They're, they're hinged together by a strong ligament. They have something called a bissel thread. If you look at the bottom of a zebra mussel, first a zebra mussel is D-shaped. It's usually got stripes, but sometimes the stripes are different coloration depending on the water they come out of. If you take them out of Mississippi, they're a lot darker. Um, but here you've got these threads, and what these threads do as an adult, they attach to hard surfaces. And they'll live a majority of their life attached to a hard surface. It's just like a little, I want to compare it to epoxy glue. They glue themselves onto that hard surface, and even after they die, I've got samples that I've taken out of Mille Lacs six months later, later laying in my locker, and it's like you, you still have trouble prying them apart. Um, they're from uh, the Caspian Sea area in Russia. They moved into Europe in the early 1800s, Czechoslovakia, Poland, in the early 1800s, moved into Europe. Were first discovered in the United States in the St. Lawrence Seaway area in about 1987, just as a fluke. It was some sampling the college was doing, some sediment samples, and a zebra mussel showed up. Since then, they've been moving within the United States. Here's a sample of some zebra mussels actually as they're filter feeding, feeding and the reason we, we call them a filter feeder is because they open their shell and they're siphoning uh, microscopic organisms. That's how they live. And they'll filter about one liter of water today a day. Each adult will do that. So here you've got some adults on the bottom of Lake Mille Lacs. Tom Jones took these pictures when, when Rich and him were diving doing some counts out there. But there, there you see the actual adult zebra mussel actually filter feeding. Preferred habitat for zebra mussels. Number one probably is native mussels. Our native mussels, for some reason, they really like to attach to them. And in new infestations, that's where we're really keying on looking at the native mussels in the lake. Because often you'll find them attached. In fact, I've got the second specimen found here out of Cross Lake, and it was attached to a native mussel. I got it up here, and you can look at it afterwards. But this was the first day that we actually verified that they were in Cross Lake. Um, this specimen is from the Mississippi River. Uh, the problem with this is we're probably going to see an elimination in some of our lakes anyway, or almost a total loss of our native mussels because they cover them so that they can't filter feed anymore, and uh, it kills them. Also, this is a photo that I believe Rich took, but they, they like to attach to aquatic plants, and some people don't understand this. We've got these rules and regulations about transporting, and especially plants, and plants coming out of Gull Lake, especially where zebra mussels have uh, grown to be in quite high numbers. I counted a uh, northern water milfoil plant that I sampled when Rich was doing diving. I was sampling plants last year on Gulf. I counted 285 zebra mussels attached to one plant. So they like plants. Okay, so here's the story. Um, I was gone the 4th of July week. I was with my family fishing in Lake of the Woods and I came back and I had a meeting with Mike. We got a monthly meeting and went down there and I checked my emails and checked my phone calls and everything looked good and I remember saying, Mike, everything's cool, we got new, no new infestations, but I went up to my office and within five minutes Nikki Schultz is calling me, she's the conservation officer who's just retired now, and she said, uh, I met with a property owner yesterday on Cross Lake and his two little girls found zebra mussels in their dock area. Uh, and then Robert Haberman in the back came in with Nikki with the samples. I've got the first samples that were taken. They're right up here if you want to look, them, look at them afterwards. The first ones we collected or that that property owner collected. Then Robert and I, um, I don't think Rich was with on the first day. We went out to that property. We looked it over. We actually tried to find some adults ourselves that day by waiting. 
Um, some bad weather moved in. We had some wind and waves, and I had gone the wrong direction to look, I found out later. <laughs> so it, the weather kind of blew us off. So the next day we came out and did some searching, and within about five minutes we came up with a couple of adults just north of that site. And again, uh, first one actually that was found is attached to this small birch stick that was in about three feet of water. And I preserved that so you can look at that afterwards. That's the first one we found. And then the second one was up on the native mussel. So that's how it all got going. And there they are. That's the first two, unfortunately, uh, that we documented. And here's the people that were doing the finding. We've got interns. And uh, they were searching that day. And my intern came up with the first one. And here he's showing it off. And then one of the other people that we work with, this is actually Justin Swart, who works with the Watercraft Inspection Program. We got a lot of volunteers within the Brainerd office just because this was this was something we needed to look into right away. So we got a bunch of people out there looking. And he came up with that snorkeling in the same area. So now we know it's verified you have zebra mussels in uh, Cross Lake. And Mike made the call to Dave Fisher, I think the same day. And within a day or two of time, WAPO has actually already got their alert out to you as an association saying what we found. Um, it was really... It made life really easy for us with the DNR, working with Wapoa, and Dave is a great ally of ours, and right away he stepped up and said, you know, we can make sure that this signage gets out to all the resorts and private access along the way. And I didn't even have to drive him up to his house. He came down two or three or four different times. He'd run out of signs. He was distributing these, make sure, make sure that people that wanted it could post their own accesses with the alert sign to alert people that there are, a bit, there are zebra mussels in that water body now, and there's rules and regulations that need to be followed, so i got to thank Dave for that. Also, I should back up a little bit. Parks and trails, the next day after we verified them, had posted all the accesses. So I know I got calls from some of you. There's a zebra mussel posting at our access. Does this really mean we have zebra mussels? Yes, it does. So the signs are up the following day on the DNR-operated accesses. Okay. Um, this was a Friday, and we had some interns that had some time on their hands, so I actually didn't get to go out with them. I pointed them to uh, Lower Hay to start there on the other end of the chain, and they put their chest waders on, and they got going, and I got out there about an hour later, and they found a zebra mussel already um, in about, again, three and a half feet of water attached to a native mussel. And this would be on the south shore. So now we have verified zebra mussels adults on both ends of the chain. Here's my intern and some of the other interns. We've got some scopes uh, that work pretty good for looking in water. Otherwise, it's just visual. You've got to pick the right day. It's got to be calm. It's intense, but throughout July then, whenever, whenever we could get a crew together, we, we scouted and looked in the shallows of the upper white fish, middle, lower, big trout quite a bit. Uh, Daggett, little pine, I was on there one day, Russian hen. I think Rich was up helping a couple days on that with his intern. We could not find any adult zebra mussels on, the, on any of those sites. Now, um, you're at an early infestation. I guess we shouldn't be surprised at that. Maybe we should be more surprised that we quick picked one up so quick on uh, lower hay. But we did not verify through uh, finding sh shoreline searches any zebra mussels on those lakes. The story is not done yet. So we want to talk about reproduction here of the zebra mussel. So, it typically starts at about 54 degree Fahrenheit water. You've got males and females when they're in close proximity. Uh, the female spews the uh, eggs out starting at 54, and they're fertilized by the males. And you could get anywhere from, you look all over the literature, and this number is all over the board. It could be 20,000 up to a million eggs that it, one single female zebra mussel can produce in one year. The eggs, again, are externally fertilized. And it, from, at about a three to five day fertilized egg, we have something right here called a villager, and this is a microscopic villager. I took this photo off the internet. It looks like a small jellyfish, um, very delicate. You can't see it with the naked eye, and they're free floating, they can't swim, they're going with wind and wave action. And for about anywhere from 20 to 30, it could be even up to 40 days, depending on water temps and variables, uh, they're in this state, they're in a villager state. Then they form a shell, they drop to the bottom, and they start their uh, life on the lake bed or attached to some object. So another thing that uh, the DNR decided we needed to do was check 
these water bodies to see if you had villagers present in your lakes. Um, the first one we chose was Lower Hay. In fact, we did, I mean, we did almost all the lakes, but we started with Lower Hay on this date, and we took five different sites on the lake, and what this is is what we call a plankton net, very fine mesh, so that these uh, small villagers won't slip through, and then there's a cup that you screw on on the bottom. You dr we drop this vertically in, say, 20 to 30 to 40 feet of water, and then just raise it straight up, and then screw up the container, and I might have some pictures of that. Yes, I do. Here he's drawing it up. This is actually on, I think this is on uh, the main whitefish. And here's uh, my intern, Tyler, bringing it up. There's that canister. Gets screwed off, and he pours the contents into a sample bottle, and then we preserve it with alcohol, and then that gets sent to our DNR lab to Gary Montz, and he has a microscope. I've got a photo coming up. He'll show you what he does. But uh, that's, that's villager sampling. So we were picking different sites on each one of your basins, and I've got a map coming up that will show in the whitefish chain where we did this sampling. Rich worked on half the lake with his intern, and I worked on the other half of the chain with my intern. So when it comes to Gary's office, then what does he do? This is really interesting. I, I hadn't seen these, actually. I got to go down there this summer because I, I wanted to see him identify them. And he's got a retrofitted dissecting scope at 14 power, and he's got this polarized light system. It's, it's a technical paper that was written several years ago, and Gary put this together and talked to the researcher. And when, if you don't use the polarized light, it's pretty difficult to determine what a villager is. You'd have to probably study him for a year or two to even come close. But he's got a, a polarized filter up here and a filter down here, and he shoots this light through it, and lo and behold, these are villagers. That round circle with the cross, there is a look-alike, there's, there's some natives, they're called ostracods. They look similar, but Gary went through it with me in about 10 or 15 minutes. I was differentiating. I mean, I wasn't an expert, but I could see what a villager was. And here's how he counts them. He sees these villagers under his scope, and he makes those counts and determines if they are zebra mussel villagers. So, okay. So Rich and I, with our interns and some other help, set out a grid and decided where we wanted to sample for villagers. And of course, here's Lower Hay, we just talked about that, five sites. So here you can see Upper Whitefish. Rich chose four sites there. Uh, site down in Bertha, Clamshell, Main Whitefish, Big Trout, or points chosen. I think we had four points in Cross, one up in Pine, one in Daggett. Any place you see a red spot is where we sampled. We had uh, 34 sample sites where we dropped that net down, pull it up, put it in the sample bottle, put them in alcohol, ship them all to Gary Mons. There was the date. We did it that week, June 22nd. Uh, timing's kind of big with searching for villagers. If we'd have waited till now, probably wouldn't have seen anything. Reproduction's pretty well over. June's a hot month, so we, we timed it on the month that would be most uh, likely that we would find villagers. And actually, I was surprised. I guess Gary wasn't. I don't know how you felt about it, Rich, but I didn't expect to see these numbers because we'd only found a couple adults. You don't know what's down there, but this kind of showed what's going on here. So even, even though we've done shoreline searches up in Little Pine and Daggett, the one site up in uh, Little Pine, four villagers showed up in that little sample. Three villagers down here, you know, in Daggett. Uh, even in the main lake where we haven't found anything, the main lake of whitefish here, you can see some small counts of villagers. Big trout, we've done a lot of source, shore searching for adults. Villagers showed couple of the sample sites. Uh, you can see the numbers got quite a bit higher in Cross Lake. 25 villagers at one site, 19 at another. Um, here's 13 villagers actually over in um, Rush Lake, right here. Four villagers over there. So if some of you haven't seen this report, I can send it to you. I've got an electronic version. But that's what we found for zebra mussel villagers on those dates. It kind of shows just that there's reproduction taking place out there and I just talked to Gary Montz, we were in a meeting with him today, talked to him quite a while, and I said, you know, Gary, we didn't find him over here, but it's a lot of water, and we're using that little net. He says, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it would be tough to, uh, in an early infestation, maybe to see him there. They're probably out there. Now, we'll just touch on Upper Hay. It was an issue, um, designated or not, a lot of feelings about it from people that live on Upper Hay. I've got, I have phone calls during the summer about it. I know Mike was concerned about it. He's probably going to talk about it. If you got questions about it, Mike will address this later. But Mike directed me to go out and take some villager samples out here. 
Actually, this was a late date, according to Gary Motz. He said, wow, you got those samples pretty late to get what you got. So four sites, plus I sampled right where the creek flows under the road. Didn't find anything there. But second site, there was one villager, although it was just remains like it was a partial. I don't know what that means. Gary doesn't know what it means. We don't know what it means. But the third site, three villagers. And like I, when I had the discussion with Gary again this morning, he says, that's, that's positive. You got them. You know, three villagers on one site, that's really telling you something. So for those of you that live on Upper Hay, and we can get into this later, but we would like those people that are removing docks and lifts, or if you're hiring a company to do it, to be inspecting your docks. We'd like verification of adults. And the only way they'll probably get reported is if you tell us. And maybe they won't show this year, but I'm, I'm guessing out on one of those docks or lifts, there's some zebra mussels. And we've got some samples up here if you're interested in looking at them so you know what to look for. But that's going to be kind of our goal this fall, not only with upper hay, but with the rest of the chain. Um, I shouldn't even be talking about this. I should have Rich talk about this. Um, because Rich was one of the divers, along with Mark Bacigalupi, the area fisheries manager out of Brainerd, and Joe Mix, the regional assistant fisheries manager out of Grand Rapids. What we wanted to do was set up some sites so that over time you can go back to the same general location, do some diving and see if you've got a population that's moving forward. And so that we set up these sites throughout the basin and what they are is 250 foot transects where we drop a lead line, the divers dive along it and search. No hits in any of these sites except right here on the east side just below the channel that you would take into Little Pine, maybe down a couple hundred yards. They went in there and it didn't take them long and they're starting to pick up zebra mussels. Uh, looks like we found four, but uh, that's, that's a real positive thing. That, you know, you, you've, got a, you've got an adult population in Cross Lake for sure. You probably do in others. Diving is kind of like, in an early infestation, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. It's really tough. So strategies for containment, um, the watercraft inspections, you are part of the watercraft inspection grant program. Uh, a lot of you are well aware of that. Public awareness through newspapers, uh, television, radio, um, your WAPOA board sending out these news releases to your members so you, they know what's happening. The signage I talked about and how WAPOA stepped forward and post, made sure all those private accesses, a majority of them got posted. Um, Enforcement, of course, has been working real close with this. We've had Robert out with us on the lake as we were doing some of these things, and we're keeping him updated, so he's aware of it for enforcement activities. And if you've got questions about that, you can, you can bring those up in our question and answers. Um, I talked to Kerry Hall, who's the watercraft inspection um, supervisor out of Brainerd, and once you were listed as infested with zebra mussels, there was already watercraft inspection hours taking place on the whitefish chain. She upped them 40 hours a week, right away, first week. She up, upped what was doing there with our watercraft inspectors. They're educating the boaters, coming and going, what they should be doing, draining their uh, live wells, pulling the plugs on the boat, making sure they aren't carrying aquatic plants or have attached zebra mussels or any foreign matter from the water body. And Carrie also told me that they increased, they already had the decon units, the decontamination units were already being used on the whitefish chain. When you became infested in July, she increased the hours or days that these guys were operating at accesses, two to three more days per week at the public accesses. So that's what's happened through her program. There are grants available, and your, your WAPOA board is well aware of these, and they're taking advantage of these. They have in the past. Um, the one thing that maybe, I know Marv worked on me with this, uh, Marv Erdman back there a number of years ago, you got grants, you've put up the big stop aquatic hitchhiker signs, so you've worked with these grants for a number of years. Marv did a great job getting these out, not just in the whitefish chain, but throughout the area. Uh, public awareness grants, billboards, you'll see those around, those are grants through the DNR, at least a majority of them are. The watercraft inspections by local government units, which you are taking advantage of as WAPOA. Um, and then just the general inspections by DNR staff in addition. If, and you can buy in if, if you don't think we're putting enough hours in there, you can work with Kerry and buy in for more hours. So the kind of partnerships we'd really like to form, and this one is what I really want to point out today, is not just Upper Hay, but all of your lakes. 
Inspect your docks, your lifts, anything, uh, anchors that maybe were part of your uh, operation out there, whatever you pull in from the lake bed, make sure you're checking them for zebra mussels. And if you think you found a zebra mussel, you can do this one of two ways. I would, I would prefer that you worked it through your association, but you can also call me, but it would be good if you worked this. This is up to Tom and Dave and however you want to work this, but we, we need a photo of what you're seeing or the sample just to report. Uh, we don't want just to report. I get reports. I, I can tell you about reports I get all summer. Uh, but we need a photo or the shell. And then either get it somehow or other, contact us and we can pick it up or see the photo. We can positively identify and start putting some points on a map because we'd like to know if there's adults in some of these other water bodies that you're seeing. So that's something we can talk about. Yeah. We'd like to partner with you on that if that's possible. And then continue this close coordination with WAPOA. I know Mike's been in contact regularly with Dave and with Tom, and I'm sure that will continue. Um, if you've got questions, call us. That's what we're here for. I'm going to stop right there and let you take over with the questions. Do we have uh, a couple of quick questions, and then we'll grab some cards if we can. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't. Dave's got a couple. Okay. We got a, what all happened this year that we found villagers in so many lakes where up until last year all these lakes didn't have them, supposedly, or were we just not looking? Okay, the, the question, and I'm going to repeat the question so we make sure we get it vi uh, vi videoed. Um, the question is, what's happened this year that all of a sudden we're finding these villagers and we've had no evidence of zebra mussels in prior years? Is that something? I, I, I can thinking? compare to Mille Lacs. So in 2005, the fisheries crew just accidentally found a couple zebra mussels. And that population was so flat for the first four years, it was almost imperceptible. Even the divers couldn't find adults. Villager numbers extremely low. When they hit 2009, though, they got a little bump. Like they were showing 4.8 zebra mussels per square foot, rich in the divers were. And since then, it's, it's taken off, and you've got a rapid rise. It's kind of your classic population. Uh, textbook where you got flat lining almost imperceptible and then they build real quick to a peak hopefully drop down someplace and plateau but this is not any different than other lake we've seen I don't think and if Rich wants to comment on it he can't he's the Mille Lacs expert so. well another thing to consider is we weren't actively looking for villagers on uh, as Dan described it's a process you know that the, the water has to be sent to a lab and somebody trained I has to look at the sample and say, aha, here are these villagers. They may well have been there last year. Uh, we, nobody was looking for them. So once the adults showed up, you know, that was the trigger. Then we went out and did the plankton work and, and started sending samples. So, um, but what Dan said is also quite true. Uh, it, 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 during the uh, initial stages of an infestation, it's very difficult to find uh, adults and, of course, you know, immature uh, forms until there's enough reproduction happening that uh, a few show up. Um, and quite frankly, I was surprised, I think Dan expressed his surprise that we found as many villagers as we did. Uh, but it indicates that it wasn't something that just happened this, this year. It's been, they've been there for a little bit of time. Here's a question, uh, I think, for further clarification, Dan, on something you spoke about. How deep in the lake do, do zebra mussels actually live? I know you spoke about water temperature for reproduction. It, it, it's all about oxygen and where the thermocline is at. Uh, Rich, you actually took the thermocline reading. What were you getting on the maximum depth for oxygen this year? We had oxygen very deep, uh, but uh, in lakes like whitefish that, that, are, that set up thermoclines, there's a significant difference above the thermocline and below the thermocline. Um, and I don't remember off the top of my head, but it, you know, there was some oxygen present even at 80 feet deep, probably not enough to support zebra mussels. Typically, we don't find them living beneath the thermocline. They are up there somewhat oxygen dependent. In uh, Gull Lake, the thermal climbs around 25 to 30 feet. We're not seeing much below that. Or we're not sampling, actually, because there's not much down there below that thermal climb. That's a little higher thermal climb. Yeah. Okay. 
Here's a question, um, sort of related, but a little bit slightly different. Is there some uh, variation in water, qual water quality that has contributed to things about clar clarity of the water, swimmer's itch, other plant materials and, and animal materials of a uh, invasive species variety, and, and hence we're starting to see a more frequency with those? Is there something happening with that water quality? I don't know that it directly is responsible for the, the presence or, or the, you know, the, the zebra mussels showing up. Um, higher nutrient levels can certainly promote plant growth, so things like Eurasian water milfoil will do better in more productive lakes, but we're not talking about Eurasian water milfoil. Uh, <laughs> I don't think there is really a, a, a connection there. The zebra mussels can live in, you know, pretty poor water quality and incredibly good water quality. They're very adaptable. That's one of the problems with them. So uh, I, I think probably not. Probably the related question to that um, is, uh, and I don't know where somebody's found this, uh, it's a tale, I think. How can zebra mussels be so bad when water quality or water clarity is improved and uh, bass fishing improves? It improves to a certain extent. If you like clean, sterile water, zebra mussels are great um, from a diver's perspective. Fantastic. Lake Michigan, where it used to be pitch black, 100 feet deep on shipwrecks, it's now ambient light. Great stuff. The problem is, zebra, in cleaning the water, zebra mussels are removing those nutrients that otherwise would be used by insects, other invertebrates, and actually uh, immature small fish. Remember, fish this big at some point in their life are that big and that's where that competition happens so if they don't have anything to eat you know it's uh, likely or the potential exists for some competition to go on so clean water is great uh, but there are prices to be paid for it we got to spread the uh, burden around among the dnr types robert we, they got a question for you i've been asking about this one since I uh, saw the uh, editorial in the Brainerd Dispatch about uh, six weeks ago, which I thought made a lot of sense. I'll read it. If we can confiscate a vehicle for shooting deer out of season, why can't we do the same for people transporting AIS? <laughs> well, as property owners, I probably would say, yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but when we confiscate vehicles or equipment, it gets to a gross misdemeanor level. It's by the severity of the law on that. If we, let's say, caught someone transporting zebra mussels to a lake, you know, should we be able to take their vehicle? Some people said yes, but the law says no. If that makes sense on that, it's the severity of the law. We even doubled the fines for AIS violations, and people still just don't care. Okay, $500 fine, whatever. You know, $100 fine for a drain plug. Some people, it's like you're taking their first born child. Others, it's whatever. You know, so yeah. it comes down to the pocketbook. But yeah, I've heard that a lot of times. Why can't we take their boat? Unfortunately, we can on that. So, or maybe not yet. Not yet. <laughs> uh, just by way of information, uh, when Dave and I did the presentation with the House Legacy Committee here a couple weeks ago, uh, we did discuss with them uh, increasing the penalty to the point where, in other words, it starts to hurt when you reach into your pocketbook. Uh, maybe we'll change behavior at, at that point. So there may be some legislators who you might hear some conversation about that this uh, session starting in February. Um, here's a question, uh, Mike and Dan, I guess you guys can handle this. I've heard there are zebra sniffing dogs. Is that true? That's, 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 Robert. that's actually mine. Um, we do have two canines uh, labs that we did train. We, we found a place out of Colorado that started doing, or not Colorado, California, started training dogs for, actually what they hit on is the adult zebra mussels. That certain scent for that, they can detect this in equipment. Um, some of the roadside checks I've had the dogs at, and we know we had them at, at the antique boat show, didn't result in finding one, but in Alexandria, one of our dogs actually did find adult zebra mussel inside a, a watercraft, and it was actually inside the, the live well on the anchor. So that's how dog on the outside of the boat sniffed it and could smell it in the anchor inside a live well. So they do work. We have two of them. Um, 
And they're my counterparts to the south, but they do travel statewide. So when we do roadside checks or any special details, I request their help and they'll come on up. So if you ever do see us working in the area, and if we have a dog, we'll stop by and feel free to ask questions on that. We had them here this summer on a couple of occasions. We, we did have them early in May when um, District 9, the local officers, we did put on a roadside check. We did have both canines up there because We've always been, and, I, and I'm a part of that, we've always been more proactive for these roadside checks. So Crowan County and everybody's been really supportive. So we, you know, in the Cross Lake area, we did have the first roadside check through 2013, and we did have both dogs there. It was a slower day, so we didn't have a lot of watercraft, but we did have them check out the boats. Is that two in Crow Wing or two in the state? Two in the state. Two in the state. Is the DNR looking to expand that force? Not that I heard of. Not for not our, our canine program is a little bit smaller. You know, we have other dogs, normal patrol dogs, but for the zebra muscle dogs, we have two. But those officers do travel all over the state. It's on request. Um, are we seeing per one per district? Probably not to this point yet. But they do work. Uh, trust me, I've, I've seen it happen. So, thanks. This is kind of a related question. Uh, has to do with the uh, any known treatments for zebra mussels and. Uh, the extent of the research that's being done. We know that Dr. Malloy has done that out east, and we've got, of course, the uh, Dr. Sorensen new, new center at the U. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Dan and Rich can, can weigh in here on the details, but the, the treatments uh, available are fairly limited. They're uh, largely, at this point, uh, confined to effectiveness in small, confined areas. Uh, for some of the biotic controls, more in aquaria or control laboratory settings or industrial kinds of uh, abrasive or, or uh, uh, kinds of treatments used in an industrial approach. But um, I think that's really the key that this uh, new position at the University of Minnesota is designed to, to try and help uh, uh, develop our new, or new research directions on how we might be able to use real-time, real-world uh, uh, natural lake setting kinds of treatments that uh, and, and river treatment systems uh, for that matter. So this is this is I think the focus of the uh, <coughs> the new uh, uh, research position at the university. Um, you know there there is uh, available science out there that gives us insights at least into some aspects of what uh, what we can ex expect to happen for for um, you know, zebra mussel infestations, other um, aquatic invasive species, but it is a growing, uh, a growing body of knowledge. And we have to recognize that, that this experience beyond the Great Lakes is relatively new to us for inland waters. And, and so when we get into these smaller lake systems, uh, granted the whitefish is the eighth largest uh, System, did I say that correctly? Tom? You did. <laughs> uh, lake system in the state. Um, the reality is that uh, we don't understand very well um, what kinds of things to expect, um, and it's a large environment to try and do control, um, even of uh, vegetation problems and other and swimmers itch and things like these. So, so this is a big issue, and I, I think. Uh, you know, we have to temper our expectations and be hopeful that, that the research products that come out of the university program and elsewhere will, will help give us some workable solutions. Dave? Um, this is Dave Fisher. Uh, I'd just like to expand on that a little bit. Uh, three weeks ago, three weeks ago, uh, several of us went down to the university and uh, listen to the presentation of one of the three finalists and as Mike said there isn't going to be a quick solution uh, the, the uh, presenter that day said we need to have persistence and patience because we probably are going to be ten years away from finding something that will absolutely work in open water it's he said if you select me as the person who's going to be doing the uh, hired by the research institute uh, don't come back and see me in six months <laughs> don't come back and see me in two years it I, and, and he laid out a very comprehensive idea of how this would be approached but he said it's going to take time and so 
Uh, there's no quick fix out there. I think that's the message. However, the uh, research really looks promising. It's really fortunate that the legislature has seen fit to fund this uh, institute at the university and uh, we are hoping to work very closely with them. Uh, if they need a lake, or a series of lakes that they want to do some testing on, uh, we've already raised our hand. So uh, but we'll, we'll see and we'll obviously keep people posted as, as things go on. They should be selecting the individual uh, now by the end of the month. So uh, we'll know and as Tom mentioned earlier on, if uh, the one person is chosen who we kind of like at this point in time, we definitely will uh, have a, I would say, an inside track or at least a, a good possibility of working closely with that institute on zebra mussels over the coming years. We've offered the whitefish chain as a research site for him. He has actually uh, been up here and, and uh, did, a, did a presentation two years ago. And uh, when he was here, Dr. Malloy, he actually did some diving on the chain and, and uh, did some, some inspection for pretty much part of the day. I'm going to change the uh, direction a little bit. Uh, Robert, I think you're going to get the bulk of these. <laughs> Um, and it primarily has to do, and I'm going to take a whole bunch of them because they're all kind of the, dealing with the same issue, which is um, I think most of this is human behavior we're trying to change, right? And so, for example, uh, how do we control people who use canoes and kayaks and go down the rivers in the whole Whitefish Pine River area? And how do we teach them to, uh, to deal with issues around prevention? What are we supposed to uh, uh, do to, to remove plugs on boats? However, the plug is not at the bottom of the bilge and some small quantity of water is left. What happens in that case? Could they be carrying villagers? Is there some enforcement action there? Uh, our docks and lifts and our service providers in that regard? Uh, the primary question is really who's monitoring and who knows what these guys are doing? Um, do you want to talk about the licensing requirements and then some of the enforcement? And yep. We'll start with the canoe and kayaks, uh, you know, with the Pine River and with the Hay Creek and all the access, Kimball Creek. Canoes, you know, they're going to access some of these small areas, walk in access, or they can. Canoes do have such a lower how we rate watercraft for the chance of spreading invasive species just for the fact that you can flip it over. The best thing for that is educate canoers. If you know people or you see someone canoeing, just remind them, hey, you know, when you get off the lake or if you're going from one lake to another, turn that canoe over get all the weeds out of it, and let it drain. Drying is the best thing for zebra mussels on that. We, you know, for equipment that comes out of zebra mussel water now for your docks and lifts coming out of the whitefish chain, requires 21 days before you gotta put it back, let's say, to another body of water. If you're gonna sell your dock or your lift, it requires now by law 21 days to dry out. That's so we know everything dies on that. So with canoes and other boats, watercraft, unfortunately, don't have the 21-day rule. Are you, you know, your daily users would be waiting every 21 days, drying them. We tell people, you know, hey, if you're out a week, the chances for that to dry out and those villagers to die, because they are such fragile when they're in that villager state, they are very fragile that that drying out will kill them on that. Um, plugs, if the plug is out, and let's say there is a little bit of residual water, because not all plugs drain out the bottom, everybody else does that little bit of gap, I know that. By law, are they transporting water? Yes, it's kind of that gray area. The plug is pulled, they've made an attempt, and that's what the law's more intent is to pull that plug and they're attempting to dry. That's why our watercraft inspectors, when they're, I know everybody gets irritated when they're at the landing with their watercraft inspectors because they tell them, make sure you dry it. And that's what I tell people, and that's what other conservation officers in the area and throughout the state, we tell people, hey, if you're going out of the lake and you're coming out of, let's say, zebra mussel infested water, let the boat dry. Pull the plug, let it dry out on there. We just had an incident where a guy was mad because it was it was raining, so he's like, I'm gonna leave my plug in, it's raining. I'm like, what you want it to drain? <laughs> but people do, they have excuses why they do this. Uh, I plug I wanna you know we had a we had an individual that wrote a complaint letter because we did issue him a citation because he, he had a live well full of Mox water with live fish in it, so that's another story. We made him pull his plug, drained all his water out and we still had to squeegee a sponge and a half out of the live well, and he wrote this letter how angry he was about this citation. Well, you were a violation of actually two laws at that point, and we went with the drain, you know, because you are 
you could be transporting these villagers. So again, that's where it came down to human nature. People who are breaking the law will break it regardless. They don't, they don't care about the risk of the environment. And some people do forget. I mean, it's busy raining, kids are screaming, that can happen. I'm a father of young kids. They distract you, you get up and you go. That's not what I'm talking about. It's the people that, you know what, I've been doing it 50 years or I just don't care. And it is it's hard. And we do issue these citations. We, we issued the $500 fines for zebra mussels, milk oil. Our watercraft inspection program works great. I, I deal with them directly in the summer and I talk to them. If I see them in the landing, I pull in and say, how's it going today? And they tell me a lot what they do. We did stop milk oil a couple times last year. I've entered just any coming to this last year coming to the chain. So that was a good stop. They stopped and said, hey, by the way, you have me raise your milk oil on your boat. And they referred it to us and they did get the $500 fine. And, some of them weren't happy, but that's the way it is, because you could have infested this water. Um, for Do Lake, you want to speak about the service providers, yep. what the monitoring and control is there too? Lake service providers, I worked Dan, with Dan and Rich on this, is they put on the training, and for modern it, when I'm at the access and I see, let's say, someone pull up with a dock boat, you know, a big dock truck, or I see them kind of taking a dock off, I'll ask them, hey, are you a lake service provider? Oh, yeah, 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 you know, I'm just doing this. You know, and if they don't have the permit, it is actually a fine. You cannot take out water-related equipment without a permit for hire. If you're doing it out of the kindness of your heart, helping your neighbor out, that's a different story. You're not a lake service provider. But if you get any monetary trade, if you're pulling someone's boat out for a pool table, whatever you're doing, you have to be a lake service provider on that. And I did issue people a few citations this spring for that. Are you a lake service provider? Yeah. Have you gone to the train? Never heard about it. Well, we've been doing it for like two years now. And I'm like, how can you do this for, he said he's been in business for eight years and you've never heard of this. Groups talk, people talk. How does your other doc guy say, oh, you know, you're making me do this. So did this individual get a citation? Yeah. Or if they're in violation of their permit, they're doing something their permit doesn't allow, we will issue them citations because they are a business and they are in and out of our bodies of water so much that we do regulate this. And I do ask, if I don't see the yellow sticker in their truck, hey, where's your, where's your sticker that says your lake service provider? Oh yeah, I just stopped into a local marina and just said, hey, by the way, you know, with whitefish being infested now with zebra mussels, did you switch your permit from regular water to now infested? Oh, I haven't yet. Well, call, call this person and they'll get it changed. It's the same training they've been through. It's just a matter of paperwork on what the equipment says. So we do monitor this. And I do have watercraft inspectors that do call me if someone is doing this type of activity that they suspect doesn't have a permit. It happens mostly in the spring where we catch these guys. And I also educate people on that is if you're gonna hire someone to do your dock, I would really make sure they are a lake service provider. They've been through the training, they know the rules and regulations, what they can and can't do. Do they always follow it? It's human nature. But it's, it's safe the way to do that is. So then you're also guaranteed you're doing that. And I know some associations put out higher lake service provider. I, you know, I don't pitch just one. I just say, make sure they are, because you'll get people knocking on your door. Hey, 100 bucks, I'll pull your dock out. Hey, for me, that'd be a deal. But are you a lake service provider? No, I'm well, sorry. You know, I want it done right on that, so. In uh, whether the lake service provider you're using uh, is actually got a permit. That resource is available. I believe we had a link on our website I think it's been updated. I'm not sure how recent, but that would be certainly one. Um, I will tell you one little technique that I used just recently. My service provider this spring said to me, uh, next spring our rates are going to go up. And I said, um, I'm not paying you five more cents until you show me your permit. Needless to say, uh, this summer he went through the training. Um, <laughs> when I discovered what he was doing, um, and this is just an alert for a number of you, some of the major providers around here, whose names you see along Highway 3, 66, and so forth, a number of them seem to try to piggyback on their licenses, but the individuals themselves do not. In other words, he's the guy that show up as a cash and carry type of an operator, and you want to be, a, uh, you know, just ask him. So, I mean, we have a duty, I think, as individual property owners uh, to sort of police that a little bit ourselves. Most of them are just lazy. The two that I referred to are, were just lazy. I didn't know I had to get around to it. I didn't know anybody really cared. I've been doing your work for 10 years. I said, well, I have an association with Wapo, and let me just say, you're, you're not gonna be the exception on this chain as far as I'm concerned. 
Um, there is an issue here related to uh, policing with respect to bass tournaments and fishing tournaments. Um, I can tell you two things that we can talk about here. Two years ago, we had a situation with a two-day tournament uh, involving uh, Camp Confidence, which was a fundraising tournament. Their first day was to be on Gull, and their second day was to be on Whitefish Chain. Um, that's when we started paying attention. On a Sunday afternoon, I had a little call with the uh, commissioner, who I've known for about 20 years, and I said, uh, I got an easy one for you. Uh, you have a regulation that you can only have two tournaments a month on any major body of water. And on Saturday, that would move, mean Gull would have three if you reverse those. In other words, you go to the Whitefish on Friday, Gull on Saturday. He said, Tom, send me those kinds of problems. Those are easy. And they reissued the permit and they changed the sequence of the two days. In other words, going from clean water to infested as opposed to the other way around. We have been trying to monitor those. I've talked to Joe Mix, usually in Grand Rapids, who issues the permits for the larger tournaments. But the smaller tournaments with fewer than 25 fishermen do not require a license. We have a lot of 25-person fishermen and fishing tournaments on this chain of lakes, the Lions Group and some others uh, that do that. I think we've tried to talk to them about doing that, but this regulation on, on uh, cleaning boats and all these kinds of things actually works for them. The problem they have is the five days of dryness and the 21 days out of the water and all those things when you're fishing tournaments every seven days uh, gets to be a bit of a problem. Do you have a comment about it? Yeah, I, I do, and, and, and not necessarily specifically related to to tournaments as much as the thinking that you're doing, I think that's very appropriate, is what are the vulnerabilities? So you know, one of our vulnerabilities is traffic through public access, is whether it's uh, uh, anglers or whether it's recreational boaters, um, that's a vulnerability. Another is through our private access, is through our resorts. Um, another vulnerability is through our backyards. Um, you know, that's one that I'm hoping that folks are thinking about is the, the backyard access ramp. That's the convenience of there, but it's also the convenience of your, your guests that may come from various places on the, on the holiday weekends, bringing boats with them. And, and that we should be thinking about all the potential vulnerabilities. What are the things that we have in place? So some of those things are the water gap inspection program, um, various laws and regulations that uh, apply to the public accesses and grant programs to help support and get messages out either through uh, 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 media campaigns or through um, support of, of local initiatives and things and, and WAPO has been very engaged in those, uh, those kinds of grant activities as well. So uh, to connect to that thread, um, I, think, I think what are the vulnerabilities? You should ask yourself those questions and what is this, the, the measures that we have in place to be able to address that vulnerability. If you don't have anything, I think you need to be getting on, on, on the horn with Dan and say, well, how do we have, how can we come up with a way to address a, a known vulnerability? Is there a program? Is there, is there an action? Is there a law uh, that we haven't thought of yet? Um, and so I would encourage you to have open dialogue with, with Dan in, in, in this area to, to help expose some of these things that haven't been covered. And incidentally, most of the major fishing tournaments, the ones that I would call the real regulated ones, uh, you, if you go out to look at their bylaws and a lot of their operating rules, they do actually have inspections and decontamination requirements and a lot of those kinds of things. Um, however, I've actually met with several of them over the last couple of years, and uh, the category that I would put in uh, the two groups in that are in there, there are those that take that very seriously and they understand the responsibility they have in going from lake to lake and, and promoting these tournaments. But the reason we have zebra mussels in some of these lakes, it's the human that could care less, and it's just careless. Um, two related ones here. Um, what if my lake wanted to be sampled for zebra mussels or villagers? Uh, have you got a, uh, a to-do list or an order that they place? Or? <laughs> In other words, it's not a lake that's been currently sampled for zebra mussels or villagers. There's no known detections. Can they be put on a list to have some precautionary or preliminary inspections done? Yeah, I, I, I think the, the, the real question to ask is, rather than, than approaching this as a, as a blind sampling, can we think about it from a, 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 a probability uh, or a risk-based approach? Um, because as Dan had stepped you through in the visuals here, there is a fair amount of effort and expertise that needs to go into this sort of thing. And, 
And the needle in the haystack approach, again, the, the, the Mille Lacs example is good, that you have known adult muscles in there in low abundance, and then, then you begin to see things uh, you know, really begin to take off, and you get all of the signals. So the, the sporadic nature of the spawning, very tight windows in the summer months, um, all these factors say that you'll want to enter into that sort of a, 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 a proactive sampling regime with some careful thought about, you know, is it, is it more likely you're going to find something by, by chance encounter of a, a, a lakeshore resident, an angler, a boater seeing something on a dock when they pull it out in the fall versus this, this random uh, searching. So, um, we're talking about sort of a, a approaches on, on that, but you know, the, the weighing the, the resources that would have to go into a, a, just a broad monitoring pro program like that is very, very challenging. Dan, did you have any uh, follow-up to that at all? Okay, well, a question would be, if we find a zebra mussel um, this fall, what's the prescribed method or pr of preserving and transporting it to the DNR? Can they grab a glass jar? Or a sandwich baggie, or what do they do? Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, keep it alive, put it in a small bag, put it in your refrigerator, keep it cool. Take a photo of it, that'll work too. I'd prefer to have the specimen. Give one of your polar representatives a call, or <clears throat> leave a message on my phone. Um, we want to see those specimens and where they came from. There are some look-alikes if you're not real familiar with the zebra mussel. Some people misidentify the uh, mystery snails. They got bands on them, they're actually a snail. Uh, the fingernail clam, a lot of time, gets misidentified. It's a small clam with some stripes. So you'll have some specimens that aren't positive, and we need to look at those. So collect them, get a hold of somebody. Don't crush them, don't throw them away in the garbage. Even if you take a photo, we'd like the shell. Can you drop them off in Brainerd? Definitely. We've got uh, our main office at Brainerd, if you haven't been there, is 1601 Minnesota Drive. Uh, come right into the center of the building. There's a big red ramp. There's a donut-shaped parking site. You come right up the uh, red ramp, take a left, come right through the doors. We've got a clerical there, and we've got a refrigerator that we put samples in right behind her. She'll label the bag, get a callback number, who delivered it, where it came from, and uh, if we're not in the office, we'll look through them when we get there. Another prevention question. I didn't write this, although I subscribe to the same principle. Would it be helpful to close some of the accesses to better monitor what's being brought in? In other words, instead of having 40 places to put boats in the lake, we'd reduce it to six or something. <laughs> We've had this conversation, right, Mike, about putting signs right in the water over the, at the end yeah, of the ramp? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know, there's, there's, there's some uh, you know, uh, logistical uh, advantages to having few choked down places that you could funnel people through. And I think I understand the, the, the nature for, for wanting to think about it that way. Um, but going back to my earlier comments, um, we can't be blind to all the other vulnerabilities and vectors. So if, if, we, if we assume that by, by really funneling the public traffic through very few points, we've, we've protected ourselves from infestation. I think we can look at examples of, of zebra mussels being moved on water, water equipment, not watercraft from private property to private property uh, in this area. So there are other vulnerabilities. So I think we want to make sure that any actions that we're contemplating have that broadest coverage of all the potential um, vulnerabilities that, that are out there. Uh, the reason I commented that with Mike, uh, when the first subject of uh, zebra mussel detection occurred in, uh, in July, we were having a, a board meeting of our uh, executive committee of WAPOA and so we asked Mike the million dollar question, which is, since the DNR controls water up to the water's edge, and local units of government manage the land up to the water's edge, wouldn't it be possible the DNR could post all those ramps in the water about a foot? And since they control the water, they could, could control that access. Simple as that may sound, we didn't get a very favorable reaction at this point. <laughs> Did I dance similarly then too? Yeah. <laughs> I think he's like Robert, he's waiting for the legislature to increase the fights, expand the authority. 
Here's a question. If zebra mussels are attracted to aquatic plants, do short, certain shorelines of plants attract more of them? Not really. Um, they offer a good, hard habitat for them to attach to. Uh, it's a random thing. If a, if a villager happens to get to that specific weight where instead of being planktonic and floating, it's, it sinks, which happens at 10 days, two weeks, and it gets lucky and it lands on a rock or a plant or a hard surface, it's happy because it can attach to it. There you go. If it isn't lucky and it falls out of the water column and it happens to be 60 feet deep and there's mud on the bottom, uh, that's about as far as it goes. You know, there's, there's, it's not particularly good habitat and very likely doesn't turn into an adult. So. Uh, it isn't as though they seek plants out and say, hey, this is a, looks like a good place to stick to. It just, it, if there are plants there and the villagers fall on them, then certainly they, they do well on plants. Do they survive in sand if they land in sand in five feet of water? Five, maybe. Any shallower than that, no. And especially on, on the chain here because of ice. Um, uh, we won't find them any year older than one year old typically three feet or shallower because they freeze or they're scoured when the ice goes out. Sand, maybe, if there's something that they can grab, you know, underneath, but typically not just on pure sand. They, they don't do well there. There's nothing to attach to. These two, two guys can tell you about the, uh, the cousin of the zebra mussel called the quagga mussel, which uh, you may have some different views on that. We don't have them on this chain. We do have them in the St. Croix, right? Parts of the Mississippi? Do you want to just touch very briefly on what's the difference between a quagga mussel and a zebra mussel? Uh, they belong to the same genus. They're very closely related. Uh, the, the main difference is uh, quaggas are significantly better able to live in uh, low oxygen uh, conditions, so they can live in significantly deeper water and they can attach to softer sediments. So uh, in, a, in a competitive situation, a quagga mussel is actually able to outcompete zebra mussels. They're even less desirable. Um, and uh, that's, that's occurred on the Great Lakes because the Great Lakes have both. And the quagga, I mean, they're sampled three and four hundred feet deep. So they're very capable of, of living at those depths and under those conditions. So if you know anyone that transports boats from the Mississippi or St. Croix River or whatever, um, let them use your boat and leave the boat on the St. Croix or the Mississippi. Those are serious problems. And they do survive the winters in many cases, whereas a zebra might even go dormant to some parts of it. Not necessarily. They all lived, I mean, if they didn't live, survive the winter, they wouldn't be here in the spring. So the <laughs> temperature isn't really a, a, a limiting factor. Um, they all kind of just go into a whatever. I, would, I wouldn't call it a hibernating state, but they don't eat as much or respire as, as, as much. So. One's not better than the other. <laughs> um, slightly different question. Our, our area of marine, marine is engaged in this activity. I noticed there's a gentleman in the back, maybe he wants to comment, uh, Jeremiah. Um, but what I was going to just tell you is a, a quick story that I'm familiar with. Our board has heard this. There is a uh, several fishing websites, blog sites apparently around. I have a son who's an active fisherman. Uh, there was a boater on that site who indicated that he had approached a marina on the whitefish chain. He was told that he needed to inspect his boat because he had previously indicated he'd been on Mille Lacs. He basically told the staff at the marina to go do something to themselves, which is kind of unkind. Um, and he proceeded to launch his boat and he explained on the website, on his blog site, where he could launch it and wouldn't have to be interfered by people. Pretty active as far as uh, allowing who goes through and who comes out, um, not only for service or just the general public. Um, um, kind of stage the questions of where you've been doing your boating or where the boat's coming from if it's an infected lake. Um, I've had some very upset people on their turnaround time for repairs. Um, they're explaining that you know if, if at a minimum uh, dry times uh, um, in, in stewed. You know, if it doesn't fit their timeline, we, we can't do it. Uh, we even go a bit further and we'll do an acid wash of uh, the boat and the trailer 
um, even above and beyond the hot water system. And, and we do have to charge for that because it's something that's uh, above and beyond. Um, but it's also their choice to boat in an infected lake um, and then, you know, bring it to a non-infected lake. So um, we're very active and I have had people that have been deterred by our response and have left. Um, I have had other people that have been so, so thankful that we've actually um, went through the depths of, uh, you know, moderated people. So it's gotten uh, more in depth for us now because um, we're sending boats from a, from an infected lake to a potentially uninfected lake. So we've had to change our practices a little bit and uh, cleaning has been the biggest one. And they have to go through the DNR service provider training program. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And all those same things. Yeah. So, um, I would give you two reactions. Number one, I think a major part of their business depends on the quality of this lake chain. So they got a vested interest. And number two, I think Dave can tell us that the majority of the marinas are members of our organization. Not all, but a large number. Yeah. This story is not, not the only story. This is, a, this is becoming a statewide trend. Even resorts are inspecting watercraft, are saying, where were you last, this last boat was at? Because some of these resorts, there is no public access. The only access is through a resort. So they're now policing their own land. It's their private property. They can tell you you can launch or not. So, And I've had people come to access. He won't let me put my boat in. And my response is, well, it's his property. So if it's not a public access, they have the right to say, no, you can't launch your boat here. And, and I think it's a great, it's, it's, and again, it's not just look like it, this is happening everywhere. And I think it's just that proactive response. And then the people that will come to us or complain or tell your staff where they can go are the ones that we're gonna run into the road with the weeds hanging and the plug in and, and all that stuff. So again, it's a small majority of people, but this is a good, it is good to police your home. Robert, I got a question for you. <laughs> the question is this. Um, when we uh, set up decontamination units, uh, can we look at who owns and operates them because of the possibility that there might be some private parties that would own some and, and do some of those kinds of things? The second part of the question is, is it better to publicize we're doing uh, de setting up decon units or is it better to do it by surprise? <laughs> Are you talking to DNR or for a, a private? Or DNR. DNR. Um, no, actually, there's a schedule that Car Carrie Hall would be more inclined to answer that. That's her part department, but we don't put out a list. This is where it's at. I usually get their schedule in case I say, okay, I run into a boat that's dirty and they had something going wrong. I'll know where the decon unit is saying, you're not launching until you get over to them. You know, so that's where I know where it's at. Um, private organizations do buy it. The Army Corps on Gull Lake bought their own decon unit. They're in, the person that's running decon is not a an actual inspector, but we tr he went through our DNR training on how to decon a boat. So then now the Army Corps has their own decon unit. Um, the Gull Lake Association ran into some trouble with running their own decon unit just for the fact that they were using it as a boat wash. And for us, it, you have to meet certain criteria before we'll, we'll wash your boat. And then it became noise problems, so public access, they couldn't use the more. So I mean, it, it, there's, there is ups and downs to it, but if an association wanted to buy their own and they had their own location where they you could advertise it, that's great. And the decon units do range in price, so a carry hall would be your best contact for that on that, so. Yeah, if, and, and, and I think uh, recognizing the DNR's capacity, um, we have five of these decon units for the Northeast region. So all the way from the tip of the arrowhead over to Hoochiching County down to uh, Crow Wing County here and over to Pine, Pine County, a big chunk of territory five of those units so um, there's there's some practical wisdom to say let's let's advertise so that we can we can get everybody's boat clean the, the functional reality is that um, you would quickly uh, max out the capacity of a limited resource and we're trying to be as targeted as we can with that limited resource that's the door open I think for the private sector as I think what you're implying Tom is to to say there's there's a niche here um, and how do we best fill that niche and, and um, there are groups that currently have grant proposals and various uh, um, you know, funding programs trying to actually bring up that capacity f to, to complement the, the DNR's part of that. Um, and then the second part and challenge at least that we're finding with the watercraft program as far as um, at least what we're experiencing in the Northeast region is the challenge of actually being able to 
to recruit and retain people to operate these units. Um, it's it's not a, a truly glamorous job to, to sit at a boat ramp, you know, um, on on sort of a randomized schedule or a, a specified schedule, and 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 it's we've revisited how we do our hiring, how we classify positions, and how we compensate people in ways to try and improve the appeal of these things. And we'll continue to work on that, but the, the reality is that we've had uh, uh, an ongoing vacancy for one of these decon units all summer long that we just could not fill despite, you know, great recruiting effort. Um, watercraft inspectors, we had, uh, you know, six to ten positions vacant all, all season long, not for lack of effort, but lack of candidates that would be interested. So we're, we're having to think about that. So, so simply having the equipment is, is one hurdle, and then trained uh, operators that operate in a way more than just a boat shining operation do it effectively with the temperature, with the, uh, with the duration of the spray. Where does the wastewater go for the decon operation? Um, I've not seen it, but I believe it's on a mat, is it not, and recycled? And yeah, uh, both Rich and I ran decons on Mille Lacs just as a test three years ago, and we set out this rubber mat that's inflated, it's like a buoy all the way around it, and you'll drive your vehicle along with the trailer right up on top of that map, and you do all the washing right there on that map. It contains it, and then there's like a vacuum with a flat nozzle right down on the mat, and that brings it right back up into the decontamination unit through a filter, so we're recycling the water. The water goes no place but back into the decon unit. And the, the filters on the decon unit filter out its heat. And it's heat, and you They do run at 140. We actually up the temperature for the decon units to close to 180, just to make sure we're killing everything. 140 is that magic number to kill zebra. But the filters on that recycling system, you literally can drink the water. <laughs> it'll, it'll filter out zebra mussel, the, the villagers, and it grabs all that. So the water actually going to the filters is cleaner than what we're pulling out of the lake. So the chance for cross-contamination is, is very, I can't say nothing's impossible, but it's, it's good. We've got a series of cards that relate to funding. Um, we could spend the next hour talking about that, but I think uh, in a nutshell, um, it relates to the DNR's budget. It relates to uh, uh, Lassard Sam's uh, legacy money. That's the three eighths one percent money, and uh, whether that's increasing or decreasing, and then the research piece. And we know a little bit about that, uh, and we can also tell you a little bit about how that all applies to this organization. Dave can fill in where I don't have all the details since he's been so intimately involved in the last three years as our president. Um, the uh, budget in the DNR for AIS has actually doubled. Uh, this particular biennium, uh, but uh, the amount of money, as I recall, is about six million dollars, and the uh, the amount the DNR requested from the legislature was considerably more than that. Um, but in many cases, it's what they refer to in the legislature. They love to do this. It's called one-time money, which is they don't need. They don't want to make a commitment. Uh, it's a little bit in this particular case, like thinking apparently this is going to go away or something. Um, and so they've been wrestling with that. What you may recall is the governor vetoed six million dollars out of the, uh, the Lassard Sams bill that came out of the House Legacy Committee. Now, the Lassard Sams body is a public body of individuals appointed to represent the state in that allocation of those th that three eighths of one percent. You know, that's the election we did in two thousand seven, eight, whatever it was. Uh, that added that three to one percent for for environment, uh, natural resources, arts. Um, so the committee makes a recommendation on all these different proposals. It goes to the House Legacy Committee, which happens to be chaired by Phyllis Kahn, and it has on it. She's out of Minneapolis, and it has on it. Uh, there's about uh, 15 people, and it includes the chairs of the major committees in environment and natural resources. So, when we had the uh, Legacy Committee here two weeks ago. Uh, we had the chair of the uh, Natural Resources and Environment Committee, Jean Luginius, is out of Minneapolis. Um, we had the, uh, the uh, economic development folks. Uh, some of you know uh, Denny McNamara, who is a representative from Hastings, who has property on Lower Hay. He is the leading minority member of, the, uh, of that House DNR uh, Natural Resources Committee. He was the chair when the 
Republicans were in authority. So they actually are the ones that then have to vote and make the recommendation on behalf of the House in appropriating the recommendation of that citizen body. When it got to the governor, it passed the House and the Senate. When it got to the governor, uh, there's a uh, gentleman who is uh, the 90-year-old matriarch of the Minnesota Vikings, along with his buddies, prevailed on the governor to not allow uh, the legacy money to be used for things like AIS. And Mr. Grant and a few others convinced the governor to veto that. They did. And the debate is going on at the moment. If you know anybody on this Lassard Sam's group, and I would suggest you talk to Rich, Rick Hansen, who's a uh, DFL representative out of South St. Paul, he has tried to convince, I sat in on one of their hearings three weeks ago, he's trying to convince his colleagues that in fact AIS is part of habitat, it's part of water, it's all part of the same puzzle, if you will. Uh, he's not having any success because there are those like Mr. Shera and a few others who believe that the legacy money was for hunting and fishing and those kinds of matters and it's not to deal with issues around habitat. Well, I've jokingly referred to as, uh, you know, I'm just a little bit pregnant. Uh, last I checked, you either are or you aren't. And so in this case, you know, if you've got AIS in your lake, it occurs to me it's going to impact all of these things in some manner. And so, so to spend a lot of time dividing this question. Now, I think Dave could tell you when we had the folks here, we tried to give them a little lesson on not only how it impacts the issues of water quality and habitat and all the rest, but in this particular area, and the research was done in 2008, so it's not current, but remember there was a recession at that point. But tourism in this area in 2007, 2008, and it looked at the period from June through May, uh, folks who visited this area with an address who were surveyed that had an address that was more than 50 miles outside of Crow Wing County spent $110 million a year on buying bait and licenses and renting boats and buying food and going to bars and restaurants and all those kinds, renting cabins and all those kinds of things. 49% of that was spent in the months of June, July, and August. So one of the things Dave and I tried to do with this legacy committee is to say, you know, you might want to open your eyes to the fact that this is also called economic development. There are businesses here, there are people employed by those businesses, and if you're not serious about allocating resources to AIS, you very well could be having a negative impact on jobs and employment and economic development in, in these areas. Um, we haven't convinced our county board of that either. Uh, we don't get a nickel out of property tax money from the county board. In other words, they apply for DNR grants, yes, and we get a share of those. Uh, but Hubbard County, Park Rapids, their lake association has convinced the county to actually include a line item in the county budget paid by the county taxpayers to support water quality in their county. That's new this either last year or this year. Uh, so we're going to try to work on that, but uh, after watching uh, the uh, county board dealing with uh, environmental issues the last couple of days, I'm not convinced I can probably be pope before they can figure this one out. Yes? When did we change the motto on our license plates? Should we or when did we? No, I said, when did we change the motto on our license plates? Yeah, exactly. For the yeah. state of 10,000 lakes, I thought. Well, yeah, I think some of them want to say there are 5,000 clean ones and 5,000 in festive ones. Something. I'm not sure. Uh, so if you're interested in that subject, I would encourage you to be writing and talking. You can go out to the uh, North Star is the state website. And if you go to the legislature and look up uh, legacy committees, you can see Lassard Sams and all those out there. You have to be talking to your legislators. Uh, in this area, I think the people like Rudinovich and John Ward and some of those get it. Uh, but we got a whole lot of them that are they're not getting it and and they got to you know, we think that there's got to be some money uh, spent on that aside from you know the general property tax enough on that um, and I think the only other thing I would add to that piece is we have talked uh, as an organization we spend what about uh, 2400 hours or whatever it is we spend Fill in that piece, and then we talked about needing five times as much just to cover the summer months if we were to cover our ramps on weekends and, and major times for about 12 hours a day. We'd need about a budget of about five times what we now spend. Yeah, that, that's right, Tom. Uh, just to give you an idea, this year, uh, WAPOA is uh, allocating about $28,000 toward 
access inspections. That's buying us uh, uh, 2,600 hours of paid monitoring uh, through uh, directly from the DNR or through the uh, program with the county uh, that we have to fund 100%. Uh, basically, all they do is uh, uh, receive some money and use it themselves. Uh, but we're we're uh, we're funding 2,600 hours in order and in order to fund seven days a week from sunrise to sunset from mid-May to mid-September we'd need uh, approximately two hundred and six thousand dollars so you can see twenty eight thousand is what we've spent this year that's about as much as we can take out of our budget uh, we, we really would like to have two hundred thousand dollars if we could find it so uh, it's it's a conundrum we're in and we're uh, we're we're working uh, to see where we can find some additional funds, but uh, right now we're that's upwards of uh, uh, you know 35 a third of our budget. And keep um, in mind, most of that is with re with respect to just having uh, individuals at those ramps inspecting boats for water, milfoil, any other kind of pond weed, anything else that may be on those. Go back to what I said earlier. Bay Lake, which is a lake chain that or a lake that is much much smaller than we are geographically. They are spending anywhere from $130,000 to $160,000 a year paid for by their property owners. They've been doing that since 1992. And all they're able to do is control the growth, the spread. They haven't eradicated it. They won't eradicate it. But they're managing that spread. And you can imagine, if we get any of these kinds of things on a chain of lakes like this, with the amount of boat traffic that comes and goes in this lake chain, it'll spread like wildfire. Um, Go ahead, go ahead. I got one last question. Then, why, why, don't, why don't you do that one and then I'll... I thought this was a perfect one to save for the end because uh, I think guys, um, you know, the guy that gets the big wages is over here to my left, so he should handle this one. <laughs> um, how well do you know the uh, U.S. Secretary of State or the former Secretary of State, Senator Kerry or, uh, or Mrs. Clinton? Question well, is, if uh, well, zebra know. mussels are uh, native to uh, Russia, <laughs> <laughs> are there known predators? Mm -hmm. Number two, um, why are European rivers and lakes not completely infested with zebra mussels? What can we do about controlling them over there? I only understand they got well, small issues going on in Europe and Asia and stuff now, politically. Yeah, I, I can first of all comment that I, I only know uh, Secretary Kerry, but I, I was a former guy from Massachusetts. So that's what we share in common. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, to the second part, uh, why aren't uh, zebra mussels a problem uh, uh, in, U in Europe and so forth? And, and certainly in their native environments, they've evolved and co-evolved with, with checks and balances, whether they're predators, whether there are uh, physical limitations to where they can occupy habitat, whether there are natural predators in place. Uh, typical of invasion ecology, um, you know, we can probably have, and we probably do in the Great Lakes and other systems, have a barrage of things coming in to us from other places, um, and most of those don't take. But it's, it's those rare instances where a, a species is introduced in a new environment, conditions are such that they can first of all survive, and then second of all, enough of them have, have arrived to be able to reproduce, and third, that there is no factors to suppress their abundance, no natural predators, no natural diseases and things like that, that's when you have this expansion um, kind. So it's an, a simple ecological um, element about it. Now I'm going to ask you for the first part of that question again. The uh, first part of that question was uh, uh, basically had to do with the fact that if it's uh, native to Russia, are there known predators? Yeah, and the known predators um, I think we have some surrogate species here that would prey on, on uh, zebra mussels. I think you find some examples in the Mississippi River and so forth. But, but from, if we reflect back on the sheer numbers of things of reproductive capacity that Dan showed us in the slides where you have you know, tens of thousands to millions of reproductive uh, in, you know, eggs and in, in such going up into the water column per individual. Um, it, you can quickly see that it's a haircut versus the, the move, removal of these things that we would imagine from a very thorough predator. 
Um, I'm going to have Dan give you two uh, kind of, are there any other last questions? Because then I've got a couple of last items that I want to leave you with. He's got a couple of statistics that leave incredible impressions. I just, I just want to know what an example of a predator is for a zebra mussel. Uh, freshwater grown is one. Can you think of some others? There's some of the, some of the, the um, fishery survey, <clears throat> excuse me, losing my voice today. The Mississippi, just down by Brainerd four years ago. And one thing they did was a stomach analysis of the fish that they took out because we had zebra mussels down there, still do. And the pumpkin seeds, I guess we shouldn't be surprised because their system is adapted for snails, to feed on snails. We're just gorged with small zebra mussels, a number of those pumpkin seed sunfish. So they graze on them pretty well. Um, over in the Ukraine, um, sturgeon, surprisingly, do a good number on them in the Ukraine. Uh, diving ducks, we've seen a big influx of divers at least two years ago in Mille Lacs in the spring. The wildlife people here in Brainerd were commenting on it. They hadn't seen a diver uh, migration in the spring like that in 30 plus years. So they probably figured out where those zebra mussels were and worked them over pretty good. So uh, loons will feed on them, some of the ducks. We've got some fish species that will. Thank you. I'll, I'll just add one, uh, Dan. We heard uh, from, uh, from our, one of our guys that does water testing for us, PLM. He's got property on Gaul, and he went down by his dock here this summer, and he discovered lots and lots of feces. He couldn't quite figure it out. Turns out it was otter feces, and what he saw in there were zebra mussels. <laughs> so we need to introduce those now. That, what's the consequence there? <laughs> yes. Uh, once, once those birds or ducks or whatever uh, pumpkin seeds have eaten, some of the zebra mussels, is there any chance going through the digestive system that these villagers would still live through that? No. The, the thing with the villager is it's extremely delicate, and uh, Robert covered it as far as in boats, but they're extremely, extremely delicate. And I'll bring this up, maybe I shouldn't bring it up, but we hear a lot about the birds spreading these, especially zebra mussels. There was a big study done in Wisconsin, I just read it here, got emailed to me. Um, and they checked out, you know, a number of ways that these things are get, going around. And it's not birds, it's proven through research. And it's obvious, if you look at the lakes that are getting zebra mussels in Minnesota, it's our high-use, high-traffic lakes. It's not showing up in our waterfall lakes. It's showing up in these high-use lakes, and that's, that's the risk. Dan, I want to give, have you uh, do the uh, kind of the uh, benediction with two pieces of statistics that I've heard you use, which are terrific. How much water are zebra mussels filtering uh, per day on uh, Mille Lacs? You should be asking Rich this because he really works in Lacs. You want to answer it, Rich? You want me to take it? Okay, so Rich does the diving out there. They've been diving since 2005. Rich is doing the sampling. I'm up in the boat because I'm not a diver, but him and Tom Jones are down there. And the population has really jumped. Uh, last year, on, they've got, uh, how many stations do we have set up? About 25. And they're diving for two to three weeks, and they're counting zebra mussels on these 600-foot transects. And then they do an estimate of how many zebra mussels per square foot are on Mille Lacs. Last year was 1,261 zebra mussels per square foot, figured throughout the whole lake. That's a lot of zebra mussels. This year, I think it was 10,000. It dropped about 200 to about 10,031 per square foot. Still a really large number. And Tom Jones did the figuring, and I've heard it two ways. There's between, there's enough zebra mussels in Mille Lacs right now. They're filtering a liter of water a day small pop can per day of water, that they can recycle all the water in Mille Lacs, if that was possible. They're recycling the water, they're filtering the water down at the lower level. But if they could filter the whole lake, they could do it in between a day and a day and a half, depending on how you run your figures. I've read 24 hours. They will filter all the water in Mille Lacs. There's enough zebra mussels in there right now to do that. So they're busy. Uh, the second one is, uh, Dan showed you a map <laughs> Uh, when they did the villager samples this summer with the uh, plankton uh, netting and the, uh, he saw some ones and twos and three villagers per site. You saw a couple, one at 25. How does that compare to uh, the, sample, the, zebra, the uh, plankton sampling on, uh, say, Gull and Mille Lacs? I I'm going to comment on Gull because I did the sampling there. I'll give, I'll give the Mille Lacs to Rich or to uh, Mike. But <clears throat> last year, three months, June, July, August. I might have gone in September. I did the villager sampling in Gull Lake. Okay, pretty good numbers. I went out in June on June 28th this year. Went to four sites with that plankton net, like you saw in the slides. Four sites on Mille Lacs. Sent the samples down to lab. Gary Mont sent it back to me. I told Tom Jones at Mille Lacs what the numbers were, and he wasn't going to believe me. But one of the sites, vertical drop, 
25 feet up, 16,800 pellagers in that one sample. So just extremely high. And when Gary saw the numbers, he said, that's enough. We know what's going on. Don't go back this year. We'll go back again next year. So extremely high numbers of villagers in Gull this year. I don't know who wants to take Mille Lacs. Do you want to take Mille Lacs? I'll let Rich take it. Typically significantly less. Uh, reproduction in, in Mille Lacs, strangely enough, um, given the blanket of, of adults on the bottom, is roughly, uh, again, across the whole lake, in the 1,200 range per net. So there's a big difference. But that's been consistent for many, many years. So we don't know uh, what's driving that. Maybe they're just not as good at it on the lax. But Gull is a, an exceptional uh, lake in that regard. And I don't know, I don't think of any others that have exceeded that that we know about. No. We've done actual counts on it. So Gull is very good at growing zebra mussels. <laughs> The reason I find those interesting, one, is their overwhelming statistics. Number two is it talks about some of the progression over time of some of these kinds of matters that really should be a warning for us that we have to be vigilant and aggressive on, on these particular lakes. Mr. Fisher, you wants to talk about a WAPO activity that we're doing? Um, several times today we referred about to what happens if I find a zebra mussel. Uh, we have sent out a, an email blast. Uh, maybe some of you have seen it. We're also in the process of sending out postcards to uh, all property owners uh, on, the, on the Whitefish chain. And that postcard has on it, or our, our website has on it, Dan Swanson's phone number and email. Uh, if you want to get a hold of Dan, when you inspect your boats and your lifts, and also the lake pickup. If you're using the lake water to sprinkle your lawn, check that pickup. They love that. Uh, and then get a hold of Dan, or conversely, as Dan said, get a hold of us. We've got uh, information on there on how to get a hold of us, because we will then work with Dan, as we've done on a lot of the other things, to make sure that we get those samples. We'll come and collect them. We'll get them to Brainerd. Uh, I know my way. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. I grew up there. <laughs> any, uh, any last questions for these folks? And we'll wrap up. It's 4 o'clock. It's uh, beverage time and, and uh, dinner then soon, I suppose, huh? Uh, for the zebra mussels to attach to something, does that have to be in, co in contact with the bottom? Like, can you leave your prop in the water and, they, and it won't oh. attach to oh. the bottom? Oh. We've got issues on Mille Lacs over on Izadi's Resort. Rich and I did some work over there last year, and those inboard outboards weren't on lifts, and they had them down in the water. And we talked to the service provider, actually the person that stores them, and his method would be to go and start up that inboard outboard, warm it up for about five minutes in the fall to get it over to the access to store it. He said every one of them overheated. So these villagers are getting inside the lower units of those motors and causing really havoc. So really a good recommendation. If, if you get to that number of zebra mussels here on your lakes, you're going to want to keep your lower units out of the water, along with pontoons and everything. If you can keep them on lifts, it's going to be a lot less problem. The one thing, again, um, I know that we're going to work with Dave on bringing in samples. I want to make sure you call Dave or call myself before you're transporting. I don't want you to, I mean, we don't want to get into, we don't want everybody traveling all over with zebra mussels because we got Robert over here that's going to have an issue. So make the phone call and tell him you're coming with it and make sure that you're, you know, coordinating it so we don't run into an enforcement problem here. And I won't call Robert. <laughs> and if you find a shopping cart full of zebra mussels, call Robert right away. Remember the guy going from uh, Lake Superior to North Dakota? Wasn't sure what he had. That actually was a piece of artwork, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, thank you, uh, Robert and Dan, Rich, Mike, um, for uh, spending the time with us. I hope you en enjoyed and, and learned some things with their uh, with their presentation and comments. Uh, unfortunately, um, zebra mussels, AIS, isn't like the weather. Uh, it's not always going to be nice, right? And it's going to change, hopefully uh, only for the better. Uh, and if you have questions, certainly you've got information that we can obtain from them. You can check on our website. Uh, we happen to have Alan Sherburn who uh, updates our website every chance he can, which uh, this year it seems like it's been about every day 
Um, and so we'll have this uh, video out there for any of your neighbors or family uh, that, uh, that couldn't be here. Number two, I'm going to put a plug in for our memberships. Um, our memberships are un unbelievably cheap at $25. If you're interested in putting some money into AIS when you submit your membership for uh, 2014, we're always hoping to uh, receive some year-end uh, 2013 money too. You on that membership form can indicate that you want it to uh, go to AIS work and it will support some of the budget that Dave was referring to as well. Um, in other words, when you designate those things, we do in fact uh, have an obligation to follow your wish. Um, you will have started getting membership information uh, here not too distant future. And uh, the sooner you respond, the quicker we can put our plans together for 2014. We see this as a, probably a year in which we're clearly going to have to try to step up a lot of our responsibility uh, because of the uh, the issue, we're going to have some obviously some opportunity in working maybe more closely with the DNR. But bottom line, uh, two takeaways on that regard: talk to your neighbors, talk to your family, talk to your friends. One of the beauties of the Whitefish Chain it seems like every neighbor is a relative <laughs> of somebody. Uh, I wonder if there's ever been a uh, an arm's length real estate transaction in this whole area. Uh, but talk to them and and get them in. Uh, one of the things I'm going to do this year. Uh, you, my wife and I, with uh, three kids and married kids and some relatives and those kinds of matters, we're always looking for something to, to provide them either for a birthday or, a, or a, at Christmas time. I know one of the things that they're all going to get this year is they're going to get a uh, $25 membership to WAPOA. Uh, and part of the reason I realized that is as I look around at meetings, and you can look around this room too, most of us are a little bit gray in the temple, some a little white, some have no hair at all. Um, but the last I looked around, most of these meetings, you know, there aren't a lot of 20 and 30 year olds. And so one of the ways to get them, I think, uh, into this system and communicate with them is through our membership, which gets them the newsletter four times a year, gets them a lot of these communications. I can tell you my three kids are in their 30s and uh, uh, ice forward to them the blasts that we've been sending out this year on zebra mussels. Uh, the exchange of communication has been extremely healthy since we started doing that. And so as a result of that, um, I'm suggesting that we probably ought to include our kids as members and, and it's a quick way to get them into this system. Some of us aren't going to be here forever, so we better get them, get them on board and, and get them into the system quickly. Dave, you got some? Um, a third of the property owners around the lake are members of Wapoa. Yes. It's a good chance that the neighbors on either side of you are not. There's about 3,700 parcels, riparian parcels around the Whitefish chain, 120 linear miles of, of lakeshore. We have about 1,000 members. There's about 27, 2,800 members or individual property owners of those 3,700 parcels. There are some own more than one. Uh, and we have about 1,000. So we have just under, just a little less than a third, or a little more than a third. Um, we need to step that up. Um, very clearly, the DNR is going to look for organizations like ourselves to be partners in this thing. Um, there isn't any doubt about that. They will never have enough money to do what's got to be done. I mean, the state will not do that. Um, I don't know if the governor is going to raise our property tax or our income taxes and property taxes, and some of our income tax county on the property tax won't do it. Um, so we're going to have to rely on ourselves to do that. And uh, so, any last questions that you may have? Um, certainly can come up and talk to these folks. There's some cookies left. There's some cider left. Appreciate having you spend the time. And um, we'll see you when we do this again and when we communicate electronically with our magazine and those kinds of matters. In the meantime, if you have any questions, give us a holler. Thank you.